portfolio questions. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 16170 in the name of Kate Forbes on Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2019. Could I invite all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible? And I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The purpose of today's debate on the Local Government Finance Order is to seek Parliament's approval to the guaranteed allocations of revenue funding for individual local authorities for the next budget year. It also seeks agreement to the allocation of additional funding for 1819, which has been identified since the 18 order was approved this time last year. And whilst elements of this debate and my speech will be quite technical, at the end of the day, this is about ensuring that local authorities can deliver real um, services for real people the length and breadth of the country. And the 1920 budget delivers a fair settlement for local government under the most challenging of circumstances. The funding package in 2019-20 provides local government with a real terms increase in both revenue and capital funding to invest in our public services and to deliver our key priority of sustainable economic growth in partnership with local authorities. In 1920, the Scottish Government will provide councils with a total funding package worth £11.2 billion. That includes revenue funding of £10.1 billion and support for capital expenditure of £1.1 billion. And today's order seeks Parliament's approval for the distribution and payment of £9.5 billion out of the revenue total of £10.1 billion. The remainder will be paid out as specific grant funding or other funding, which will be distributed later as agreed with COSLA. And so this overall funding package for next year includes an additional £90 million to protect spending on day-to-day -day services as announced on the 31st of January as part of stage one of the budget bill. It includes an additional £40 million of support for social care for the implementation of the Carers Act and extending free personal care for under 65s. It includes a further £120 million from health to local government to support health and social care. And it includes an additional £210 million of revenue and £25 million of capital to support the expansion of early learning education and childcare to 1140 hours by 2020. And, presiding officer, I could go on. It also includes £88 million to maintain the pupil-teacher ratio and secure places for all probationers who require one. And lastly, presiding officer, the flexibility for local authorities to increase council tax levels by up to 3% in real terms, worth an estimated £124 million. So this settlement, plus the other sources of income available to councils through the increase to the council tax, means that the overall potential increase in spending power to support local authority services amounts to £621 million. There remains a further £62.5 million of revenue funding that will be distributed once the necessary information becomes available, and that will be included for approval in the 2020 order. And the amounts involved, yes, I will. Alexander Stewart. I thank the member for taking that intervention. Uh, the Minister has given us a, a list of uh, monies available, but can I ask the Minister, why is it the case then every single council is cutting millions of pounds off their budgets and in some councils making hundreds of people redundant? Minister. Well, of course, the, the member has voted against in stage one and stage three of this budget for additional resource going to local authorities. And that is real money going to real people for real services, the length and breadth of the country. And you don't need to believe me, believe the independent analysis from SPICE, which makes clear that the overall funding going to local authorities is going up. Also look at the comments by um, the president of COSLA uh, after stage three, or after stage one actually, which welcomed the empowerment of local authorities as part of this budget. So we make clear that we work in partnership with COSLA and with local authorities. We recognize that there are commitments, there are challenges that they have identified, and we have ensured that in this 
funding package, there is the finances to deliver the many services that I've just outlined, whether that's expanding um, care to the under 65s, whether it's ensuring that we can expand early learning and childcare, or whether it's ensuring that they have the basic capital they need to invest in infrastructure. And so, as I said, there's undistributed revenue funding, and it's important that when it comes to um, distributing that in terms of uh, teachers' induction schemes, discretionary housing payments, mental health, school counselling services, that we do that in conjunction with COSLA. In addition to the revenue funding contained within today's order, there is also specific revenue funding that's paid directly by the relevant policy areas under separate legislation. And that amounts to just over uh, half a billion pounds, 507 million pounds, including, and the uh, members will be aware of this, 120 million of pupil equity funding, 86.5 million pounds for criminal justice social work funding, um, funding for early le learning and um, childcare expansion, for the Northern Ferries and for Gaelic funding as well. This order also seeks approval for changes to funding allocations for last year of £54.1 million, which have been added to fund a number of agreed spending commitments. I will. Mike Grumbles. Obviously, he understands, we all, all understand that some council has to be at the bottom of the league table, but Aberdeen City Council is at the bottom of the league table and has been for a number of years. Could you give an indication of when you expect Aberdeen City Council to receive a fairer funding settlement that will move it off the bottom of this league table? Minister. Contrary, all local authorities receive their needs-based formula share of the total funding available from the Scottish Government. They keep every penny of non-domestic rates to ensure that there is adequate funding. So whilst every local authority probably has a unique case to make for why they believe that there should be additional funding, it's up to COSLA to consider the distribu distribution methodology. And if all local authorities can agree to revisit it, then that's a totally different question altogether. But as it is... Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to the Minister and of course she's technically quite correct to say that councils keep every single penny of additional business rates income. Will she accept that uh, the government claws back every single penny of additional business rates income from the general revenue grant? What I would agree is that in terms of the, you know, it is clear, it is technically correct to say that Aberdeen Council and every other council keeps every penny of non-domestic rates. And that is reflected in the funding settlement that they receive. And that is reflected in the money that they have to deliver their core services. And every local authority has that ability to keep every penny of council tax and every penny of non-domestic rates. And the general revenue grant reflects that commitment that local authorities keep their um, non-domestic rates. Moving on to capital funding, um, although not part of today's order, the settlement for local government includes um, £1 billion of capital budget, which is an increase of £207 million on last year, or 24%. That is a significant boost to support local authorities' investment in their schools, in their roads, and in other infrastructure. And, presiding officer, I touched briefly on business rates, but the distributable amount of non-domestic rates income for 1920 has been set at £2.8 billion in 1920. And I can confirm, as I have said before, and I will say again, that all local authorities will retain every single penny of non-domestic rates income collected within their area. And the Scottish Government will continue to guarantee each local authority the combined general revenue grant plus non-domestic rates income. So in conclusion, presiding officer, whilst today's debate can become quite technical, at the end of the day, it's ensuring that local authorities have the funding that they need to deliver the services they need for the people of this country who rely on them day in, day out. And I move the motion. I think it's a motion to be moved in my name. Thank you very much. I call Murdo Fraser to be followed by James Kelly. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The uh, Local Government Finance Order comes at the tail end of the budget process. We seem to have spent weeks debating the Scottish Government's tax and spending choices, uh, and it might seem at this point in the process there's not much new uh, that we can add, but this is still an important part of the uh, parliamentary process. The, the Finance Order before us allocates funding to each of Scotland's 32 local authorities. We don't, do not intend to oppose the order, as to do so would simply be to, to deprive local government of much needed resources for the coming year. However, we do have concerns about the overall allocation of cash to local councils. 
Well, let me start by being generous with the Scottish Government, because I am, as the Chamber knows, a very fair-minded person. And as a very fair-minded person, I accept, with, with one important caveat that I'll come to, but I accept the basic proposition being put by the Minister that overall support from the Scottish Government to local councils has increased compared to last year. According to SPICE, it is up by 1.1% in real terms, amounting to some £110 million for revenue. And once the capital budget is included, the increase is 2.8% in real terms, or some £298.9 million. But, but that is not the full story, as the Scottish Government well knows. Because some of that additional money is ring-fenced for specific purposes and cannot be spent flexibly by local councils. So while the total budget has increased, the core budget, which councils have discretion on how to spend, is down on last year by 2.5% or £230 million. Pounds. Uh, just a second. Those are the figures from SPICE, and they are indisputable. It's Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. Thank you for giving, giving way. Um, the Conservatives obviously don't agree with this, so I'm puzzled by your statement that you're not going to vote against it because of course if you did vote against it and it didn't pass the government would simply the government would simply bring a new order murder freezer well, I, I think us abstaining on this is a reasonable position to take the liberal democrats voted, voted down i think if all parliament voted down there would be real danger that councils who in many cases have already set their budgets for the coming year will be left in a black hole situation so i'm not sure voting it down is a particularly wise political tactic, but given it's being put forward by the Liberal Democrats, it isn't going to matter anyway, presiding officer. <laughs> now, now having, set out, having set out in a very fair-minded fashion, presiding officer, in a very fair-minded fashion, the overall spending picture of being a very fair-minded person, I'm sure the Minister, who's equally fair-minded, will, in her winding up, accept the basic facts as I've set them out, and the fact that the core grant is down. And in case there's any doubt about that, we see this right across the country. All you have to do is open any local newspaper in any part of the country and you will see councils having to make cuts. Cuts to the number of teachers, cuts to the length of the school week, cuts to school crossing patrollers, closures of public conveniences, closures of libraries, closures of leisure centres. These are choices not being made lightly by local councils, but choices which have been forced upon them by this Scottish Government. And at the same time, councils are having to make choices about increasing taxes and charges. And let's not forget, we have a Scottish Government elected on a manifesto commitment not to increase the council tax above 3%. And yet we now know there are at least 11 councils across Scotland of all different political persuasions now increasing their council tax by the maximum permitted of 4.79%. Of course I will. Minister. Could the member explain why Tory councillors across the country have supported the maximum council tax rises? Murder Fraser. <laughs> Sorry, officer. I don't know if the minister actually checked, but in the, the finance secretary own local council, SNP run Renfrewshire, they've increased the council tax by the maximum of 4.79%. And I'm not going to criticise any council when they've been given the unpalatable choice of making a tax increase or cutting vital services or having to make that difficult choice when protect the services that local people rely upon. And then at the same time, councils are looking at what other revenue they might raise, for example, from a tourist tax, which of course the SNP said they would never introduce, or from the new car park tax, which would of course hit uh, lowest earners the hardest as a regressive form of taxation. And there's a real concern from local government that if they decide not to introduce these new charges, then they will in future years be penalised by the Scottish Government for not doing so. And it'd be good to hear from the Minister in her winding up speech confirmation that the Scottish Government will not seek to claw back money uh, from uh, councils who have made the choice not to impose either a tourist tax or the car parking charge. Presiding officer, this is all against the scenario where the Scottish Government's block grant from Westminster is up in real terms compared to last year. So there was no need for cuts of this order to local government having to be made and no need for these hard choices to be forced upon local authorities. Presiding officer, we would have taken a different approach. I was very interested to see the Finance Secretary saying at the weekend that an independent Scotland would eliminate its deficit in a few years, a few years by growing the economy more quickly. And it just gives rise to the question, why are they not growing the economy more quickly now, given all the powers at their disposal? Well, did the Scottish Government think 
they can eliminate a deficit of £13 billion in a few years by growing the economy. They can hardly argue it is unreasonable for us to argue that by growing the economy just a little bit faster than it's currently growing, we could generate additional tax revenues to provide better funding for local authorities. And we should never forget that in terms of the fiscal framework, it is our economic performance relative to the rest of the United Kingdom that is what matters. And the Fiscal Commission's projections show that for each of the next four years, economic growth in Scotland and as a consequence income tax revenues are expected to lag behind the UK average. That means we will have less money to spend and that is why the focus on growing the economy is absolutely vital. Presiding officer, as I said at the start, we will not oppose this order today because we do not want to penalise local government. But that does not mean we support this funding settlement. It will have a negative impact on councils across Scotland where we are seeing increased council tax, increased charges and poorer services and the responsibility for that rests firmly at the door of this SNP government. Thank you. Thank you. I call James Kelly to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the Minister, in her opening statement, um, tried to put a good gloss on the, the settlement that's been given to local government uh, in terms of the figures that were presented. But the reality is, the situation that local government faces is that, um, in spite of what money will be allocated as a result of today's order, uh, local councils are facing increased responsibilities in terms of delivery on childcare and also uh, health and social care partnerships. Um, and what that therefore means is that in terms of core funding, day-to-day -day responsibilities that councils have had to deliver on year on year, uh, these will be reduced by £230 million a year in, in real terms. And, yes, sure. John Mason. The member seems to be criticising the increase in childcare. Can he confirm that he is opposed to the 1140 hours of childcare? James Kelly. You're inaccurate, Mr Mason. I, s I merely described the, I described the situation where councils have got increased responsibilities in childcare. What I was criticising was the decrease in core funding for, for £230 million. So the, the reality uh, of the situation is that uh, the funding that's been allocated from the government means that councils, and you can see the evidence of this across the country, uh, are having to make cuts in their budget. And what that's actually doing is it's undermining some of the, uh, of the main kind of policy commitments of the government. So we've got a government that are committed to jobs and growing the economy, uh, something that Scottish Labour agrees with. But uh, analysis from Unison shows that over period since 2011, 30,000 jobs have been lost. So that's 30,000 people, less people working in communities, um, contributing to uh, local businesses and local shops and making a, a contribution. That's detrimental to the economy. In education, uh, the government and the First Minister have made great play of education being a number one priority. But we see in Dundee, the education budget has been cut by 3%. And that's going to reduce teacher numbers uh, in that, in that uh, city council alone by 26. Uh, added to that, if you look at uh, Murray, for example, where there are going to be library closures on today of all days of World Book Day, then that undermines the, the educational effort which the government have been so keen to promote, something that, again, the Scottish Labour supports. The government uh, are also keen quite rightly, to support vulnerable people um, uh, in Scotland. But if you look at Clark Manninshire, for example, we're going to see the ending of support to Citizens Advice Bureau and also food banks, undermining help to vulnerable people. Health and wellbeing is another big policy area for the government. But we see in Murray that the sports development programme is going to be closed down. Um, and that, that undermines efforts you know, to try and promote uh, health and well-being and tackle issues like uh, obesity. So on a number of key policy areas that the, the Scottish Government set out, the local government settlement is going to undermine uh, those to, to seeking to make progress uh, or achieving targets in those areas. So, I mean, I think as uh, Murdo Fraser pointed out, we're, we're now reaching the end of the process and 
I think it is useful to look at you know, how, how we would move forward. I mean, Labour have consistently throughout the budget process argued that we should be more progressive in terms of taxation. But uh, I think one of the things about this year's budget process is it's the first year of the new budget process, which uh, tries to take a kind of longer term view of the budget. It's fair to say that that's still settling in. Um, but I think in the year ahead, you know, I think we need to avoid the approach where all the effort on the budget gets concertinered in to between uh, December and February. Can uh, I yeah, sure. Minister. Um, I thank the member for that, for letting me in. Um, on that point, in terms of parties putting forward their own proposals, costing them, being clear about the tax proposition, there's obviously a lot of things in our budget, and I imagine that the Labour Party might just might welcome some aspects of it. Are there elements, how do they suggest we improve the budget process when it comes to party negotiations next year? James Kelly. Briefly. Well, I was, I was just I'm glad you made that intervention, so it's coming to that point. The reality of the budget negotiation process this year is that the government focused their efforts on the Greens because they clearly concluded that that was the, the party that they were best placed to do a deal with. Uh, I met with the Cabinet Secretary. I outlined what Labour's budget priorities were. I outlined areas where I thought that tax should be more progressive in order to fund uh, those priorities. But the, the, the Cabinet Secretary only afforded me 10 minutes. And I, I just don't think that's uh, proper respect to the process. I think in terms of local government, we all need to acknowledge that year on year local government has been reduced and that's made it difficult in local communities. If we want to adopt a different approach which will help local government and also help the, the Scottish government in terms of achieving its policy objectives, then the negotiations and the dis discussions need to start uh, earlier. I'm certainly prepared to, to be part of that, but the government have to respect all the opposition parties in the parliament and not simply just focus on... Focus on uh, I, 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 conclude, I, take, I, take the, I take the point, but again, the government need to respect the, the other parties that they're having discussions with. A 10-minute discussion uh, is just simply disrespectful and it's not taking the process seriously. So let's have a different approach from everyone next year. Thank you. And I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, can I thank James Kelly for his comments regarding the budget process and negotiations. Uh, as you'll be well aware, I outlined some thoughts about that in the Stage 3 uh, debate, and I hope we can actually work together, perhaps not to ensure that all parties are going to support the budget next year, but certainly we give far greater, uh, there's far greater prospect of the different priorities that different parties attach uh, to the budget uh, being secured. Um, as Murder Fraser said, this is an important debate. It comes at the end of the process, but we are being asked to approve an order which allocates almost 9.5 billion to local uh, government, money which will, as the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, the Minister uh, said, will be used to uh, deliver a very wide range of vital public services from education to social care, leisure, recreation, transport um, and housing. And as members know, following last year's budget, Greens made it very clear uh, that no negotiations could take place this year unless there was, first of all, a serious, credible and substantive process begun to increase the financial autonomy of local authorities, to reform local taxation, shift the balance of funding from the centre to the local and put in place the same sort of fiscal framework that exists between the UK and Scotland uh, in relation to devolved budgets in place for local government. And that's why on the 21st of February last year, we wrote to the First Minister to outline why we need local tax reform. It's why last March we published a paper outlining what a fiscal framework for local government might look like. And it's also why I will be introducing a bill to Parliament to incorporate the European Charter for Local Self-Government into Scots law. And is also why we will be supporting the motion today since we did agree a deal with the Scottish Government to do so. And in any event, to vote against the motion is to deny revenue support to local government. Now, following Green's engagement with the budget process, this settlement mitigates some of the cuts to the general revenue grant and distributable NDR that had been planned. It does not eliminate them, but this was not for want of trying. This year's negotiations were genuinely difficult, 
but those parties with alternative ideas about how things could realistically have turned out differently need to reflect on how much effort was made and what they might have achieved that we couldn't. But I would stress that this is not a, 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 a funding allocation that we would like to be voting for. Presiding officer, it is fundamentally wrong that so much of the revenue and capital budgets of local government is determined by this parliament. In 2014, COSLA's Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy published its final report in which it argued that, and I quote, the case for much stronger local democracy is founded in the simple premise that it is fundamentally better for decisions about those aspirations to be made by those that are most affected by them. And this is a familiar argument, I'm sure the Minister will recognise it, from the 2014 independence debate, when much of the same argument was made by those on the yes side in relationship to Scottish independence. But now for more than 50 years, local democracy in Scotland has been eroded to the point where Scotland is now one of the least democratic countries in Europe, with the weakest structure of local governance and with the least fiscal freedom. Across most European countries, at least 50% of the budget of municipalities and communes is raised locally, delivering a sense of accountability that's entirely missing in Scotland, where the local politicians who make the decisions about raising and spending money are the politicians that you elect to local government and that you meet on a daily basis on the street, in the shops, in the school playground. Presiding officer, it is particularly an affront to local democracy that the limited and regressive tax power that they do have, the council tax, remains the most regressive tax in the UK, based on a tax base last assessed 25 years ago, and with rate capping in place, that in my view is unlawful and would not be allowed in most other European countries. So, presiding officer, I do not feel comfortable sitting in this parliament and voting on how much money local government should receive, but we are where we are, we reached a deal, and we will be supporting the order at decision time. Thank you. I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This year was supposed to mark significant movement on the reform of local government finance. It was supposed to empower local councils. It was supposed to mark the end of harsh budgets. It was supposed to mark the end of the council tax. Yet the council tax has not been scrapped. It's been increased. That's the Green Party folly number one in this budget process. The budgets for councils were set to be cut by £230 million as a result of this budget. The Greens said it could be fixed with £90 million. Green Party folly number two. So, not just now. Social care budgets are even under threat to the tune of £50 million. Apparently it's flexibility, but it could be a cut to social care. Green Party folly number three. And what... And what I'll take one second. And what was this about the supposed new tax powers dressed up as reform? The grandest folly of them all. Handing councils a bunch of taxes they don't want, that won't work, that won't raise the money they need, is certainly not reform. It's another example of this government treating councils with disrespect. The Greens have sold out local government because they are too afraid to stand up to their allies in the SNP. And I'll take and an intervention. Andy Whiteman. Mr Rennie, thank you very much indeed. Um, he mentioned at the beginning of his contribution the council tax. He is well aware that the council tax is defined in law. It will require primary legislation to get rid of it. There was never any prospect that this budget would scrap the council tax. What this budget deal has done is to reach an agreement, which I hope Willie Rennie and his party will join us, in sitting down and agreeing a future that can lead to published legislation with a commitment to legislate in two and a half years' time. Willie Rennie. I was, he actually predicts what I was going to raise, Mr Whiteman. Um, the Greens sold out for a ropey promise. It was nothing more than a ropey promise on local government finance reform. But there is no commitment from the SNP, absolutely no commitment. It's a promise to hold yet more talks to do some work that new legislation might be possible, possibly after the next election, if there is a possible agreement. If that's a cast iron agreement, I think it's particularly rusty. And I think the Greens should be ashamed that they've been sold out on this and they've accepted this deal. Not just now. The SNP and the Greens tell us that they have 
got more money for local government. But if that is the case, why is SNP-run Dundee Council increasing the cost of Brexit clubs from £1.25 to £10 a week? If there is more money for councils, why is Conservative-run Murray Council charging families £370 for school transport? If there is more money for councils, why is SNP-run Fife Council slashing education spending by millions of pounds? And if local government settlement is so good, why is the SNP-run Falkirk Council increasing charges for childcare and social care meals? I'll take an intervention from the Minister. Minister. Okay, I was just going to ask what the Lib Dems have delivered in two and a half years of this Parliament through the budget. The Greens have delivered a lot more than the Lib Dems have. Liberal De <laughs> Greens have sold out local government. Liberal Democrats have stood up for a variety of different things, including making sure that mental health services are the top priority, despite the government's opposition to that proposition. So the Greens have sold out for that ropey promise on local government finance reform. And I can tell the Minister today that, of course, we will work together for change. We want to see the end of the council tax. We want local government finance reform where councils have the freedom to raise the majority of the money that they spend, just like Holyrood. But we refuse to be duped again. We wasted our time in the last talking shop where the SNP ignored 16 out of the 19 recommendations. So if, and only if, the SNP set out precisely what they are prepared to support, and if that support is for substantial change, will we sit down and take part? We have talked endlessly over the last decade, and we've seen nothing for it. The SNP have shown no signs of changing, and it's about time they recognise that. And if I could finally, President Officer, return to Aberdeen and Edinburgh, my favourite subject over the last few financial settlements for councils. We were promised that Aberdeen and Edinburgh would have 85% at least of the average of national spending for councils. Now, for years, the SNP flouted that promise and that commitment. They provided money for Edinburgh and Aberdeen that was below 85%. So what did the SNP do? They didn't give more money to Edinburgh and Aberdeen. They fiddled with the figures. They've changed the formula. They've taken the highest spending councils out, so now that the average is now lower. This is a con for Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and the SNP and the Greens should be ashamed of it. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Tom Mason. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, Parliament will, I trust, approve guaranteed 2019-20 uh, to 20, uh, revenue funding allocations for local authorities, ensuring we deliver on the settlement reached through work undertaken at all three stages of the Scottish budget process. The Scottish Government is being pushed towards ever more difficult choices when it comes to public spending and finance, thanks to successive Labour, Coalition and Tory UK governments, whose cuts have ensured we now have a budget £2 billion less in real terms than in 2010. It is in that challenging context that in 2019-20 the Scottish Government will provide councils with funding of £11.2 billion, a £287.5 million or 2.9 per cent increase on this year and indeed will also add £54.1 million to this year's current funding. This will allow councils to continue delivering frontline services to the most vulnerable people in our communities, ranging from health and social care to transport, environmental health, leisure, recreation, housing and education. Funding includes an additional £88 million to maintain pupil-teacher ratios, £25 million in capital to fulfil our commitment to expanding LLA and childcare to 1140 hours by 2020, and a new £50 million town centre fund to support economic improvement in our towns and drive inclusive growth. And council tax at Band D uh, in the current year is £453 on average less than England, and from April will be £456 a year on average less than south of the border. These are just some examples of how the Scottish Government is determined not just to maintain the status quo, it is working to build a fairer and better Scotland. Of course, some members would rather exclude uh, some funding from their calculations. However, important day-to-day -day services such as nursery provision should never be considered to be anything else. This finance order means that the resource and capital available to North Ayrshire Council will increase by 26.66 million from 279.842 million to 306.502 million, a 9.5% uplift. So in Cunningham North, my constituents will also benefit from increased health spending as NHS Ayrshire and Land's budget increases 3.6% to 720 million. 
The 2019 uh, budget um, it also seeks to empower local authorities, for example, by, with the power to apply a transient visitor levy. The Convention of Scottish Local Authorities made a strong case for councils to have this power. It was a key issue for the Greens. Well, an amendment to the Transport Scotland Bill will enable local authorities to exercise a workplace parking levy and the devolution of empty property rates relief to local authorities delivers more fiscal freedom so that decisions can be made closer to communities. In recognition of the need for longer-term budget stability for local authorities, the Scottish Government is also committed to working with COSLA to move towards three-year budget settlements from 2020-21. This will furnish councils with the ability to pursue more long-term sustainable financial planning. When I asked Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government Aileen Campbell, MSP, last week about Scottish Government action to protect uh, local government from the near collapse experienced in England and Wales, she pointed out that while councils in England and Wales have faced real terms budget cuts of 28% between 2011 and 2018, we have sought to treat local government fairly. In Cardiff, population third of a million, this week the Labour Council cut 55 jobs to add to the 1,632 lost in the last seven years. It will cut a further 93 million from its budget over the next three years, adding to the 218 million cut over the last decade. It will also put the council tax up by 4.9% in April. We would say that Tory austerity is to blame, but even when the Welsh Labour government is forced to reduce council budgets, I still expect Labour MSPs to blame the SNP government. It is grossly hypocritical for Labour and Tory MSPs to claim SNP ministers are squeezing Scottish councils when their own parties are crippling local authorities in England and Wales. Presiding officers, strong and stable is perhaps a much maligned phrase in recent years, but stability we have delivered. A local authority settlement that delivers certainty to our public services cannot be underestimated at a time when the UK Tory government appears to be self-destructing. We are using our powers in a progressive way to protect and invest in our public services, boosting funder for North Ayrshire Council and across Scotland. That means greater resources for our schools, hospitals and all the vital services which protect some of the most vulnerable in our communities. By voting for the Finance Order 2019, we will vote to protect Scotland's local government services and their recipients. Thank you. <coughs> Can I call Tom Mason to be followed by Louis MacDonald? Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I declare an interest as an Aberdeen City Councillor. In a year where the Scottish Government has more money to spend on public services in real terms, the situation faced by local authorities is difficult, to say the least. Across the board, the councils are facing funding gaps. These are not just numbers on a page, these are people's jobs and services on which we rely. Now, it must be mentioned that the lack of a revised financial circular before our debate seriously hampers the ability of this Parliament and MSPs from across all parties to scrutinise decisions by the Scottish Government in a proper and effective way. It, it is not acceptable, and I urge Ministers to review the way in which this process operates before the MSP reaches its budget deal with the Greens next year. However, we must work with the figures available. According to the version of the financial circular that we have, every single council in Scotland faces a reduction in their revenue support grant. Every single one, that is, apart from Renfrewshire. I forgot what constituency the financial secretary represents, but I'm sure that doesn't really matter. In any case, presiding officer, the information we have indicates a cut to the discretionary spending made available to the councils from this government, down from nearly 6.8 billion last year to just over 6.6 .6 billion this year. I reiterate, for the benefit of the Chamber, the Scottish Government has more money to spend than last year. Therefore, cuts to local authorities are not just entirely avoidable. They have only come about... No. <laughs> they have only come about through the political choice of the SNP Government. It is rich indeed to say the councils are a priority, but to leave places like, places like Aberdeen City in my own region facing cuts of, of 41 million in one year alone, and that had to be decided just the last few days. That is just to stand still. It would have been better if we could have kept the non domestic rate, 28 million we were prevented from. You will let us have 28 million pounds, will you? Through the chair, please. All comments through the chair. Well, I may, have, may I ask the minister to make sure, you know, summing up, she guarantees we get the £28 million pounds back. More, the resulting cuts were more than 200 jobs lost and cuts to community organisations such as Sports Aberdeen, Visit Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen Performing Arts. 
One of the proposed savings was even cutting £2,000 by reduce, reducing colour photocopying. Local authorities taken back to the black and white era because this SNP government, government will not fund the, the local count, councils properly. It was unfortunate then when faced with such general budget cuts, the minister responsible for supporting local government was missing in action. Even for his own area, his silence was unfortunately deafening. It is not sufficient to take, uh, to take an axe to central revenue funding, and then invent some new and unpalatable tax ideas, such as the hated car tax, tax, so that councillors can take the hit in cleaning up the mess made by the government. Now, we will not oppose this order today, but ministers should not mistake that for an endorsement, their understanding of local government should not mistake the, this, this, this non-opposition for a, as, as an endorsement. This local authority finance settlement is a story of cuts to public services, and only because this government took the conscious decision to make them necessary. But simply presiding officer Scotland deserves better. Vital local services need a funding settlement that recognises their needs rather than being treated as an, as an afterthought. So in time, I hope ministers will reflect on this and take responsibility for the mess that they have created. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Maureen Wood. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Today's debate marks the formal conclusion of the annual budget process for local government funding. But as members have said, it is the tough decisions councils have had to make up and down the land that are the real life outcomes of this process. Local councillors are rightly accountable to their electorates for the decisions they make. But this year, once again, those decisions are largely about what cuts to make to which services, rather than to how to grow or enhance the services councils provide. That is a very limited accountability. Responsibility for the larger decisions on local government finance lie here. And that is why this debate can never be a mere formality. If the funding which ministers choose to provide means cuts to services or to jobs, then ministers as well as councillors have to be accountable for those cuts. This year's settlement also highlights wider issues around accountability of local councils to local people. Year on year, ministers have reduced central government's contribution to local government funding, but they have failed to loosen their grip on local government's ability to make their own decisions. In my home city of Aberdeen, Local council taxpayers, local business ratepayers, and citizens paying fees and charges for council services now contribute a whopping 87% of the city council's revenue budget. Now, there is a case to be made for councils to be self-sufficient. The problem here is that despite being funded almost entirely from local resources, the city council still cannot make its own funding and spending decisions in full. And when an additional £28 million comes in from non-domestic rates, none of the benefit stays in the city, as the Minister has acknowledged. Every single penny is clawed back through a reduction in the General Revenue Grant. And that's the context in which the General Revenue Grant for Aberdeen this coming year has been cut by a third in a single year and is now on a par with the smallest mainland and island councils rather than with Scotland's other cities. Despite those challenges, I am delighted that Aberdeen City Council this week was able to protect the community projects supported by the Fairer Aberdeen Fund and rejected the suggestion of making savings at the expense of staff terms and conditions. Those were the right choices to make in the face of a multi-million pound funding gap, but tough choices still are to be made and some options remain effectively closed off by Scottish ministers. Take one example. Aberdeen City Council owns the largest fleet of hydrogen-powered buses in Europe, but those buses are operated by private companies. The Council would like to have the option of creating its own bus company, but ministers have so far refused to contemplate a public bus company competing with private operators in spite of amendments being tabled to that effect to the Transport Bill. Visit Aberdeenshire has been mentioned. It is an effective and innovative innovative and a well-respected agency which promotes city as well as shire. And I am sorry that their funding from the City Council will be cut to avoid other cuts elsewhere. But that funding gap could have been filled by a transient visitor levy had that been in place by now. If only ministers had not spent so long resisting a tour in a moment, if only ministers had not spent so long 
resisting a tourism tax, even though that was strongly supported by so many members of the Minister's own party and local government. Uh, we're already over time, I'm afraid. So, Minister, if you wish it to be moved from your own time. Yes, well, it was just a very quick one. Why then did the, the member vote against the budget um, and, with, and the agreement with the Greens, which would have enabled Aberdeen to, to get that? Because the Quickly, Minister, please, the minister has acknowledged that, she, that, that, that in real terms, the money that is being provided by her government to the Council is clawed back in another way. And we all recognise, I think, the need for local government funding to be reformed, both in relation to council tax and business rates. But more than that, the whole relationship between central and local government must be revisited so that councils either get the funding they need from the centre or have the freedom to make their own decisions, preferably both. At the moment, a dynamic and progressive council like Aberdeen has neither the funds nor the freedom it needs, and that must change if we are to have truly accountable and effective local government in future. We're already over time, due warning. I probably have to cut the closing speeches. Last of the open debate contributions is from Maureen Wood. And I'm pleased to be taking part in this short debate this afternoon to confirm the cash settlement for local government this year, which will see an increase of 287.5 million in cash terms, a 2.9% increase, bringing the total revenue spend for local government to 11.2 billion pounds, which is almost a third of the total Scottish budget. It also delivers an increase in capital spend of 207.6 million, uh, uh, which is a 23.7% increase. In all, a budget six £120 million pounds higher than it is currently. And this is done against a backdrop of continuing austerity, which we must not forget is a political choice of the Westminster Tory government, indeed introduced when they were in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. And we know that it hits those who can least afford it most. We've been told that austerity is about to end, but we've not seen a single bit of evidence of this. Presiding officer, there's much nonsense spread around about local government funding, and it was perpetrated by Mike Rumbles again today. I don't know how many times in this chamber the minister has reiterated, reiterated that councils retain all the monies raised in non-domestic rates, and that this is taken into account in the local government settlement and the in, in distribution to individual local authorities. And I have heard that this should not be taken into account. But of course, we only hear that it shouldn't be taken into account when income from this source is rising, not when it's in falling. And it's absolutely essential that the Scottish government can use its powers to deliver equity across the country. And of course, the Scottish government, along with COSLA, keep the distribution formu formula under constant review. And I hope the, cap the minister can confirm that the distribution formula indicators are updated every year to ensure that each local authority receives its fair share of total available funding. I've not seen any indication recently from COSLA for a desire to change the formula. Indeed, once uh, a few years ago, uh, when at a at a COSLA meeting, Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire couldn't even agree to support each other to bring this forward. And when we talk about a funding floor, that was fought for by my late colleague Brian Adam and implemented by the SNP administration, not in the previous Liberal Democrat to uh, Labour administration. So thereafter, yes, of course. Lewis MacDonald. Does, does Maureen, Maureen Watt mentions the 85% funding for, does she acknowledge that this year the funding settlement for Aberdeen City Council is at 81% of the national average? Maureen well, Watt. I do acknowledge that the percentage change in Aberdeen City Council is an increase of 5.7% for Aberdeenshire 4.34% when the Scottish average is 4.03%. So I think Aberdeen can see, we, people of Aberdeen can see that they have had a higher increase than the average. But of course, after that, it's up to local authorities themselves as to how they spend the money. And I don't know if the Tories and Labour and the Liberal Democrats read what comes into their inbox and read the public sector online, which every day shows that councils south of the border are facing bankruptcy, and we've not got that in Scotland. 
And I'm sure, I hope the Minister will agree, that it ill behoves Aberdeen City Council administration of Tories and excluded from Labour Party councillors to moan about their settlement when they continue to mismanage their funds. For example, their council debt repayments are 42 million, an increase of 9 million Could you come this to year close, alone. Please? They are completely uh, uh, been unable to keep projects within budget. The Broad Street redesign, Lockside Academy, I could go on and on. And an 8 million spend, overspend on Union Terrace Gardens before they've please. even started. That is what Aberdeen City residents face. We now move to the, the closing speeches, and I call Alex Rowley. No more than four minutes, please. Presiding officer, um, I was first elected to Fife Regional Council back in 1990, and became the chair of the finance on the 1994, and then leader of Fife Council. And over all those years, what I have seen is local government becoming much more efficient and much more effective, and key to the way that local government works is that the finances, the budgets, are linked to the policies and to the strategies so that you know what it is that you're actually focusing your spend on. Now, I'm not sure that the same could be said for the Scottish Government, who has a budget uh, over around £37 billion. And, and, and within that budget, I actually think that there is room to start to look at how effective, how efficient is that budget actually being spent and how is it actually contributing to the strategies and policies that the Scottish Government say are their priorities. And there are many examples of that. Um, we have strategies and we have, we have legislation. And I actually believe, as James Kelly says, the budget decisions undermine a lot of those strategies and those, those, those um, uh, legislation. So you have legislation, the child poverty targets, we're seeing few poverty targets coming forward. Uh, the government say that closing the educational attainment gap is, is a key priority, yet as Willie Rennie says, in five millions of pounds are being stripped out the secondary education budgets right now. So tell teachers, tell pupils, tell parents that, that, that there is a real terms increase to the budgets and they won't be leave that. Yep, that's Kate Ford. Two quick points. Firstly, on the um, local government outturn um, figures of 17 18, it showed quite clearly that the education figures of spend were up. But secondly, in terms of this year's budget, we have, there's a much talk about, you know, a real terms increase to our budget, but we have passed that on to health, which means a cut to every other area. So what would the Labour Party suggest we do in terms of the efficiency of the Scottish Government process? Where would we find the money to do all that the Labour Party want to do? I'll give you up to four and a half minutes. Come back Rowley. to that point. But the first point I'd make is that, in real terms, the budget has increased. As Derek Mackay acknowledged when he came to the Local Government Committee, that the government, the Scottish Government, have brought forward £400 million of new spending commitments that local authorities have had to pick up. And that's why uh, the core budget has received a cut. But rather than politicians arguing back and forward this room about whether it's a cut or, or it's an increase, the fact is out there in the doorsteps, across Fife, across uh, the, the, the whole of Scotland, people themselves are seeing the cuts to local government services. They're experiencing the cuts to local government services, so they don't have to listen to politicians going back and forward in here with these arguments. But James Kelly has said, let's try and learn from this, let's move forward from this, and let's look at how the parties in here can come together. Let's look at how we can have some meaningful debate and discussion and how we can ask the question, is the Scottish Government expenditure of £37 billion being spent in the most effective and efficient way? Is that expenditure actually tuned in to the strategic goals and objectives of the government when it comes to tackling poverty, when it comes to increasing educational opportunity? Because the answer I would have to say from a local government perspective is no, it is not. 
and those council cuts are impacting on the ability to deliver the very strategies that you have put forward. So, so let's get some kind of consensus at the end of this process, and that consensus can be, let's, as Andy Whiteman says, look at the process of how this parliament reaches its conclusions on the budget, and let's start to work together, because that's what the people of Scotland want. They want an end to the cuts to frontline services. They want investment in their communities. We can do that if we start to look at working together on a budget process, and that's a challenge I think the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary need to address um, moving forward. I call Alexander Stewart. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As my colleague Murdo Fraser indicated in his opening remarks, we will not be opposing today's local government finance order. But it is absolutely clear this is to ensure that councils receive their funding and certainly does not mean that we agree with the content, far from it. As I've mentioned many times before in this chamber, the Scottish Government's attitude towards local government has been one of disrespect and contempt. While funding from the Scottish Government from the UK has increased, the SNP continue with their programme. Time is tight, I want to make some progress. Despite repeated cuts on the core budget, councils are still being asked to do more. A report in the Herald in January this year suggested that 58% of funding for councils was now ring-fenced. While ring-fencing uh, is to be uh, protected in many ways and we rely on education, childcare, health, social care, it means that funding reductions are being dealt with across other areas. Culture, roads, economic development, planning are all being hit. This is uh, quite uh, unbelievable that the spending, as I say, that we have uh, is ensuring that many of these functions uh, are being eroded uh, and removed. The local government benchmarking framework shows that in 2010, 11 and 17, 18, there was 22% reduction in culture and leisure services, a 34% reduction in planning budgets, a 15% reduction in spending on roads and a 10% reduction in environmental services. These, Deputy Presiding Officer, have had massive impacts on communities across uh, Scotland. Uh, it is difficult to know what the full impact on non refencing uh, in the current situation is. Uh, and the taxpayer wanted a fair deal. Uh, the minister talks about having a fair settlement. Well, they didn't get a fair settlement. What they've actually got is they pay more and they get less. The SNP has simply passed the buck to local authorities to, to to make up their funding shortfall by raising taxes, increasing fees and charges. Uh, as I've said before, they're paying more to get less. New taxes, are, as we've already heard today, the car park taxing levy has been introduced and the tourism tax will be introduced. This can be seen most clearly. And the SNP themselves have broke their own 2016 election manifesto pledge that allowed councils to raise council tax beyond the 3% cap. Many councils have suggested that the reduction in core funding has forced them into proposing increases beyond the 3% and that is directly at the behest of this government. In some cases council taxes have increased by the new maximum eye-watering 4.79%. While it comes to local government the SNP are taking with one hand but they're asking councils also to take with the other. Councils have been forced to borrow more from the capital projects, which overall the level of council debt across Scotland is increasing to 15.1 billion by the end of this financial year. This was an increase of 4.3% on the previous financial year. This leads to increased borrowing costs and puts yet more pressure on already difficult revenue budget situations. Deputy Presiding Officer, this funding settlement is neither fair nor necessary one. While funding for the Scottish Government has increased, core funding for councils has decreased. The present crisis for the local government finances is entirely the SNP's making and is one that they are forcing councils and councillors to take the blame for the Scottish Government's cuts. As I've said, the Scottish Conservatives will not oppose today's order, not because it is a good one, but because it ensures local government at least gets something from this deal. You know, education, tourism, culture, social care, leisure, planning have all been affected. In my own region, Perth and Canross, Stirling, Fife, Clackmannan, all of them are suffering from this government's cuts and they believe that they are being sold out. And many constituents who I meet across my region are telling me that. So I cannot take on board that the SNP government here today believe it's a fair settlement because it's not. Thank you. 
call Kate Forbes. Close this debate for Thank five minutes, you, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think it's, it's been a good debate, and I'm delighted that I think this is the last one of the budget process. So congratulations to us all for getting to this point. But, Presiding Officer, there's much talk about the overall quantum, overall um, funding that is going to local authorities. And for the opposition parties to make their point about cuts, they have got to deliberately exclude ring-fenced funding, which presents a distorted picture of the resources that are available to local councils. That is real money to be spent on real day-to-day -day services, for example, in our schools and in our nurseries. These are areas that councillors and COSLA identified as areas of challenge, and we have ensured that there is funding available. And it is important to view the settlement package as a whole. And SPICE has confirmed that it does provide an increase in local government day-to-day -day spending for local services in cash terms and in real terms. Yes. Fraser. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. Uh, if the situ situation is as rosy as she just paints, why is it that in every local paper in the land we hear about the sort of cuts we've heard about in the Chamber this afternoon from all different members where councils are having to make really, really tough choices about cutting what people would regard as vital services? Kate Forbes. Yeah, I thank the member for that question and I'm certainly not trying to present a totally rosy picture and I said in my opening statement that these are challenging financial circumstances for us all. It is a challenging financial circumstance for the Scottish Government. As I said, there is talk about the Scottish Government's budget going up. But if you remove the health uplift, the Scottish Government fiscal resource blank block grant funding goes down by £340 million pounds, or 1.3% in real terms. And that means that we have got to make difficult decisions when it comes to other areas. But we've ensured that we protect local government funding and we, we've ensured that in terms of core services, they have the spending that they need to be able to deliver those core services. We have treated local government fairly. Yes. Andy Whiteman. Member for taking intervention. Is it not somewhat contradictory to argue that, on the one hand, if you ring fence Barnet Consequentials, it means a cut to the Scottish budget, and yet not apply the same argument to the Scottish uh, revenue grant for local authorities? Kate Forbes. No, I, I don't think it's. Um, I don't know what the word you used was, um, but I think that when it comes to the areas of challenge that. Um, we have got, we recognise that health is a challenge and so we're delighted to pass on the, the health consequentials to the health um, service. But it does mean that when it comes to the other uh, finances that we have available, we have got to make sure we use it well and wisely and that we work in partnership with local authorities to deliver the services that the people of Scotland expect us to deliver. And there's talk too about the 85% floor in Aberdeen and in Edinburgh. We, of course, uh, were the government that introduced the 85% funding floor and all, lo all local authorities receive 85% of the Scottish average revenue funding per head. And, you know, when it comes to ensuring that every local authority, every part of this country gets a fair deal, we want to make sure, and that's why all local authorities receive their needs-based formula share of the total funding available from the Scottish government. There's been a few points made about council tax and it's important, I think, to note that these increases come after a 10-year freeze in order to protect families and the rises this year are still on average lower than the rises in council tax that are being seen in England. So in terms of a challenging fiscal environment, we have tried to protect local authorities. We've tried to ensure that they get their fair share of funding. And we've tried to ensure that the services that people rely on are protected. Of course, there's been much talk too about actions to empower local authorities. And when it comes to uh, this budget, we have agreed that we will uh, consult on a number of different actions to empower local authorities as perhaps the most significant empowerment of local authorities since devolution. And that includes a locally determined transient visitor levy. It includes an amendment to the transport bill. It includes the devolution of non-domestic rates, empty property relief. And it also will include cross-party talks on replacing the current council tax. But I want to conclude with a point around process, which was well made by James Kelly and well made by Alec Rowley. And my request to the other parties is this, that if you want a better process next year, can you commit to bring forward sensible, costed proposals that we can all consider well and early in the process, um, and that would certainly improve the process from the government's perspective.
That concludes the debate on local government finance, Scotland Order 2019 draft. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. If you could find your seats quickly, please.